This is called Rapid Deployment Project, and please welcome Mike Weber. The Rapid Deployment Project was the result of several years of doing consulting and teaching Nagios um, and seeing a couple of things that I wanted to try to implement. The Rapid Deployment Project is focused not only on delivering, setting up hosts quick, quickly, hosts and services, but more importantly, setting up a design that is efficient. So efficient design that allows you to control multiple hosts and services from service templates, host templates, host groups, etc., using object inheritance. And also then, second part of uh, rapid deployment was over years of taking notes and doing projects, try, I, I started to realize I should put this stuff in a database. All of these plugins, what plugin works best in this situation, and document it and put it into a database so it's easier for me to access that. So I started to develop a database. And then the third element is trying to push these settings out in an efficient manner. So it really comes back to a problem with size. Five years ago, I was doing projects where there were 1,000 service checks. Currently, I have one project with 150,000 and another with 200,000. Everything's getting bigger. And when you have 150,000 service checks, you know that you can't sit there and implement this manually. It's just too big. But more importantly, you can't manage it efficiently if you install it incorrectly. The other thing I see is that administrator resources, the administrators who are Nagios administrators, often are losing time. They don't have the time to do some of these projects that their management thinks that they can do. Also, I see administrator skills are on the downswing. Many of these large organizations have Linux administrators that understand how to do everything they need to do. But there are a whole host of sub-administrators, other people in the organization, that really can't do things manually because they don't understand the process. They don't have the ability to do the troubleshooting, et cetera. So that's one of the reasons uh, why the rapid deployment. When I looked at current options, uh, if you look at Nagios Core, there are a lot of scripts out there for rapid deployment. The one thing I didn't like with many of the scripts that I tried uh, and I played with is the focus was on implementing the services and hosts. And there was very little emphasis on trying to figure out how to manage those resources once they were implemented. In Nagios XI, there's the auto discovery wizard, which discovers hosts and ports. And there's also the bulk host import wizard, which allows you to clone hosts with their services, host groups, etc. Let's look at a couple of these. Auto discovery allows you to go out on your network and discover all those hosts and all those ports that are available on those hosts. So you come up with a nice list for your host, uh, what kind of connections are there. Well, obviously, the problem with this is that it discovers hosts, it discovers ports, and that's very beneficial, but you really don't know what's going on inside. And that's the problem with the auto discovery wizard, is you're only implementing about a third or maybe 25% of what you want to do. The bulk host cloning wizard, in this example, I'm cloning a Hadoop cl cluster host. So I can choose a host. And what I'm thinking with this is that I have another host that is very similar. So I can select all of those service checks that relate to a Hadoop cluster, for example. Then I have five fields, IP address, a name, a description, one host group, and also the parent host. So as great as these things are, they do help you. There's no doubt about it. In this project, 
I wanted to implement more than one host group. I wanted to be able to implement a specific host template. I wanted to have some kind of options for exceptions. When you clone a host, and that host has local settings, in other words, if you have a host, and in that host, you've de defined for that specific host, when you want to check that host, right in the host config, those are local settings. I can't change those with a template. This is one of the things that can be a deficiency with a bulk host uh, import wizard. Now, I could clone a host that was using object inheritance, and it gets me a little further down the road. So I don't have those local settings, so I could make changes with templates. But still, I'm limited to host groups, um, only one host group. So in this project, I wanted to be able to bring in multiple host groups. So for example, if I had a Linux server, I want those Linux OS metrics, those basic metrics of uh, CPU, disk space, memory, all those things. You want to push through all of your Linux hosts. I also wanted to be able to manage it based on, if this is an Apache server, I want to push all of the Apache checks to it. If this is a MySQL server, I want to push all of my MySQL checks. One thing that I've seen is when you manage things individually, you tend to do this broad scatter where you don't spend the necessary time to evaluate your checks and spend the time with them and think about the triggers and do the kind of work that is going to give you the efficient implementation that you really want. And so that's one of the reasons I focused on host groups. So this project has three features. One, efficient design. In this design, you want to use object inheritance. In other words, I'm going to show you how to take five objects, hosts, services, host groups, uh, service template, and services, and host group, host template, five objects, and set up a structure. Now, you could do something a lot more complex. But what I see, and one of the things that I will repeat, is don't implement something by design that all of your staff can't troubleshoot. Don't have three people implement three different ways, because then you have three different troubleshooting methods. You know this stuff is going to break. You know you're going to have to troubleshoot it. So troubleshooting is part of what you have to think about. Thinking about the service checks that you select, spending time evaluating what do we really need to make good decisions about our implementation? What triggers do we need to use? Taking defaults is not necessarily a good implementation of your Nagios project, because those defaults may not fit with your organization. Think about, should we have triggers at three minutes? Do we have the necessity to look at our servers because they are so CPU intensive? Our application breaks at 85%. Maybe you want to check based on uh, seconds. Maybe that's more important. Thinking about the things that break your, your uh, servers and what you're trying to do is an important part in determining your triggers. Notification, thinking about the notification so that you can have the structure that gives you the kind of design that you really want. Thinking about exceptions. Whenever you use templates, whenever you're using object inheritance, the curse is going to be exceptions. The more exceptions you have, the bigger problems you will have. If you have networks that are all based on exceptions, in other words, everything is unique, everything is different, you're not going to be able to use object inheritance very efficiently. Secondly, efficient check design, check selection. So in, my, in the experience that I've had, and I, I started collecting all this data and all this information, and I, I just said to myself, I should put this in a database. 
I'm going through all these pages, trying to find all this stuff. So I created a database. And the design for the database was that I could search out what I wanted. If I had a Windows server, I wanted to go right to all of the checks for those Windows 2000 servers that I could implement with WMI. And then I want to be able to drill down. I want to see all the CPU checks and the options and a description of those options in my database. And more importantly, if I had Nagios Core, I want to just copy that, check, and paste it into my Nagios server, and it's working. If I have XI, I want to see a screenshot of how it looks so I have no problems implement that, implementing that into my Nagios implementation. I want to have scripts that I can download. All I have to do is make them executable, and I know that they work. I want to spend the time thinking about what's the best Oracle check, and I want to have descriptions of every option and I want to be able to go there and implement it and not waste my time going to Nagios Exchange, trying this one, trying this one, trying this one, et cetera. So efficient check selection is also a big part of this project. And then efficient deployment. I want to deploy hundreds of servers in just a few minutes. And I want to know that it's not going to create a lot of problems for me. So, Design principles, the idea is to create a skeleton, a backbone for how this is all going to be structured and all hooked together. So the skeleton means you're going to implement several hosts of every type. So if I have Linux production servers that have MySQL and Apache, I want to implement those manually. I want everyone on my staff to look at those checks and say, are those the right Apache checks? Do you have an opinion about that? If I have uh, SQL servers, I want my SQL database guys to say, is this right? Are the triggers correct? Do I need to modify something? My skeleton is built on all kinds of input from lots of people so that I don't have to do this again. I don't want to take defaults and then come back and say, OK, now we have to go back and change all that stuff. That's inefficient, and I don't want any part of that. So I want to create a situation where I can manage all of the services for a host group from one service template. We decide that we need to cha uh, start checking at four minutes instead of five minutes. I want to go to one file, make that change, and push it out to my 1,000 servers. I want efficiency in everything I can do. Simplicity. Now, there are many ways to create object inheritance. The problem with object inheritance is the troubleshooting aspect. I don't know how many times People have asked me, oh, I can't understand where this is coming from. Well, if you have nested your templates, or if you have stacked template upon template, that change that is haunting you may be several templates away, and you're looking in the wrong place. So what I want to show you is a way that you're only using one template. There is no nesting. Simplicity. Now, if your staff understands the nesting and they can troubleshoot the nesting, hey, it's got great, great options there. There's nothing wrong with that. But the focus should be on if you build it, you have to be able to troubleshoot it. It's always what you're going to have to focus on. And we've got to be able to manage exceptions. So when I set up a host, that host has no check settings no alert settings, no miscellaneous settings. It has nothing. It has an IP and a host name. And it's tied to a host group and a host template. It's empty. It has no local settings. Because if I have 100 Windows servers and I have one Windows server that needs to be a little bit different, it's an exception. I can go and I can set up local settings for that. So if I had to change that host from a six minute check to a five minute or a three minute check, and it's an exception, I have that option. So building in exceptions is going to be important for you. Here's the structure. It's about as simple as you can get. Your host 
is tied to a host template and a host group. You want to get rid of that host, remove it from the host template, host group, and delete the host. You don't have to do anything else. Your services are tied to a service template which push all of those services for that host group into the host group. Five pieces. It can't get much simpler than this. Here's an example. Uh, this is a host template. And you can see that in this host template for a Linux development host, it has all of the checks that you're going to want to push for all of those Linux development services. Hosts, sorry. For all of those Linux development hosts. Here's an example in XI. So for a host template, you're going to set up your check settings, your alert settings, and your miscellaneous settings. Notice that you are pushing all of your checks on how you're going to check this host from the host template. The host itself does not have a check command. That's going to allow you to create exceptions. So look at this check here, check ICMP. And this, this presents an illustration. So if you're trying to select uh, services that will give you efficiency, here's a good example. Check ICMP, and we're using it three times, the dash N3 is three. This, by looking and, and thinking about checks and analyzing this uh, checks, this particular check is 50 times faster than a check ping. 50 times faster than a check ping that's doing five pings. So this is way faster than F ping. A simple check ICMP, which is a check that you use all the time across your network, think what kind of resources this will save you in six months on your network. Thinking about the kind of check you're going to use in trying to find efficiency is part of this whole concept so that you get the best for what you can do. Here is a couple examples of host groups, simple host groups, a name, alias, and the members of that host group. And remember, the service template pushes all the services to the particular host group. In XI, same thing, simple setup. Your host groups are just buckets that you'll drop your hosts into. Here's an example of a host in, in core. This host has nothing except a name and an IP address. There's nothing there. This allows you to make changes if this is going to end up being an exception for some reason. Here is a host in XI. So notice that there are no check settings, there are no alert settings, there are no miscellaneous settings. They're all empty. The only thing I'm putting in is the host name, the IP address, and you can see at the bottom, I'm connecting to a template, a host template, and I'm connecting to a host group. That's all I have to do, and it's going to populate all of the checks that I want for this host. Service template, uh, here's for a Linux production service. Uh, services, and so those are the settings that will be inherited for all of those Linux production services in uh, core. XI, same thing. Again, we're setting up our check settings, our alert settings, our miscellaneous settings in the template, not in the specific service. And notice that it's tied to a host group. Services, you can see the services are using a service template so that the service template is actually determining the check interval, who's going to get notified, et cetera. Same thing in uh, XI. Your service is going to define the service, be tied to a template, and the template then is tied to a host group. So maintaining simplicity. This is really important if you're starting out here. If you have experience and your staff has experience, sure, make it more complex. But with five objects, host template, host group, service template, services, and hosts, you can build an efficient structure that gives you efficiency in design, implementation, and also troubleshooting. 
not using nesting in this example. Don't forget to add into that aspect training. There's nothing worse than one administrator setting everything up, nobody really understanding what that person did, and then he leaves. Everybody has experienced that in their organization, and it's something you have to train everybody so everybody understands how to deal with the problems. Your exceptions. You have two things you can do for exceptions. You can change those local settings. Because the local settings are empty, you can then add local settings because that host or service is an exception. Or you can create two object model where you take a service template and you say, OK, we have a lot of exceptions for these Linux hosts. And because of these exceptions, we're going to put those settings in another template. And we're going to tie those exceptions to that template. So here's an example of local settings, local exceptions. So here is a host. And let's say that this is an Apache host that is facing the internet. Because it's facing the internet, you have turned off check ping. Well, that means that you can't see if this host is alive with a check ICMP or a check ping. So you can make it exception. Because it's empty, you can change to checking to see if this host is alive based on check HTTP. So that's an idea in terms of what I'm talking about with giving you those local exceptions so you can make changes. Here's an exception where you have a service that is monitoring the var partition. Let's say you've got a bunch of Linux machines, and they don't all have var as a partition. So you would set up a service, tie it to a host or a service template, and notice that we're not tying it to a host group here. We're just tying it to those hosts which are exceptions. Now, if you have 100 exceptions, maybe you want to use a host group. But this is assuming that you have few exceptions, and therefore you could just select those hosts that have those exceptions and push those out to those hosts. So summary, I want to focus on design leverage. And that is the object inheritance. When you set something up, you want to think about what are the implications of this design in six months? Is this going to make my life easier, or is this going to be a curse? If administration comes to me and says, hey, you need to change these settings, do I have a design that gives me efficiency so I can make those changes and my life is easier as an administrator? I want to focus on simplicity, because you know you're going to have to fix it. And I want to focus on creating design exceptions. Now, the service check database. This database in this project uh, the particular design is so that you can discover all of, all of those services that you want to implement, and you have a searchable database. So you can search and very quickly and efficient, efficiently find what you need and implement that. So this is what I decided to do for myself. I'm hoping to have 1,000 services into the database by the first of the year and start making it available to other people. So here's what it does. You can search by type. This is an, we're using NRPE, so you want to list all the NRPE checks. Or we're using WMI. Or we're going to use NSClient++ 4.x, different than 3.x. We want to be able to see groups. I want to see all the Linux OS metrics. What are some options that I have for all of those metrics for Linux hosts, uh, memory, disk, CPU? I want to be able to see all the SQL checks. What are the best SQL checks that I can use in my servers? I don't want to have to go to Exchange and test and test and test. I want something that I can see something that's been tested on the version that I'm using so that I know that they'll work, and with an example, Oracle, Apache, et cetera. I want to be able to search by OS. Windows 2008, different than Windows 2012 sometimes. 
I want to know that I can search for 2012 because that's what I have in my organization. I want to have an explanation of variables because many times, because you take the defaults you don't recognize, there are variables you could use and it would make that check a whole lot more efficient for you. It would give you information that would help you make better decisions. I want to be able to copy and paste. This is one thing that was really important, is I don't want to have to type in some code that somebody said this might be a great idea. I want to be able to copy, paste, make it executable, done. That is part of the design. I want an example of every check that I want to use in XI. An example in text and a picture, a screenshot, which highlights the changes that I need to make. I want textual examples for everything I want to do in core. So I created three databases, one for Nagios Core, one for Nagios XI, and one for rapid deployment. The Nagios Core database is all text-based, of course, but I've designed it so that administrators can find the check that they want, copy, paste, and they're done. All they have to do is indicate the host that they want to push this to. Uh, Nagios XI, it's going to be the same searchable database, but it's going to give you a screenshot of every check in the CCM so there's no doubt about how to implement it. So you're not wasting your time how to write what you have to put in there. And the rapid deployment has got scripts, typically, ideas on how to be more efficient, how to deploy services in a more more efficient, faster manner. So here's an example of the actual database. And you can see uh, it's got the name of the check, the date it was implemented. And I initially put in the date so that you knew, hey, this wasn't done 10 years ago. This actually works and was tested on something that's current. The type of check, WMI, SNMP, whatever you've got. Uh, your group. So if I wanted to see all the WMI checks for logs, I could put those two searches together, and I would have a list of everything that I wanted to do. Uh, SNMP, WMI, NRPE, whatever you wanted. Groups, operating system. So you can see the operating system will say, hey, this was tested on 2012. It may work on 2003, but it was tested on 2012, and you know that information. Here's an example of a script. This is a Hadoop cluster CPU one-minute check. So Hadoop clusters are really concerned about the load in a very short interval. This is a check. Copy, paste, make it executable, write a command definition, and you got a new check. Making this as easy as possible. Here's screenshots of that same Hadoop cluster check so that you have an idea of exactly what you have to put in into uh, Nagios XI. There's another example of NRPE check, or NTP check. Here's an example of a check for Oracle showing you when you look at the command view, you understand what you have to put in there in, in the command definition. Also, you can see the highlighted information. There is the text string that I want to put in there if I want to uh, connect up, uh, see connected users. There will also be a text string that will clearly define what that will be so that you can copy and paste it into your XI and change the numbers that you want to use as a trigger. So one of the current projects I'm working on is WMI. Um, and for example, when I look at, I'm doing a project with 800 servers that require WMI, and so one of the things I started looking at is wh why not use the latest version? And when I looked at the WMI latest version, 159, the author says this will save you 60% when it executes because it's using by, uh, some compiled uh, parts to it. So if I can save 60% on 800 servers, I've got to go to 1.59. And so one of the projects I've been trying to do is trying to discover what actually works. Uh, because it has 70 checks by default, 
They don't all work on 2012. They don't all work on 2008. Which ones work and which ones don't? This is the kind of information that I want to develop, put into a database, so somebody else doesn't have to do that discovery. They can just see exactly what will work and help them be more efficient. Uh, I just did a project on Oracle databases. What I tried to do, uh, select the best Oracle checks, define them, cre create, put them into the database so that people can easily see those. If they got Oracle, here's the decisions. This is the best place to go. You don't have to do uh, a lot of other things. You can uh, manage your Oracle database. SQL database, the same thing trying to figure the best kinds of checks in order to implement this. So that brings us to the rapid deployment. And I'll show you two examples here. One, Nagios Core, and then XI. The Nagios uh, Core script that you can download is going to implement multiple hosts, parents, switches, and routers with MRTG. This is a project that I did for an organization that had uh, 450 stores across the United States. Every store was pretty much the same. So we wanted to implement this, and each store had all kinds of stuff. They had Windows servers, Linux servers, music servers, time clocks, 20 registers, uh, switch, a router, all kinds of stuff. So this script was designed, and one of the reasons I'm making this script available is, hey, it gives you an idea that it doesn't matter what kind of host you have. You can put this together with many different hosts and still make it work based on the host group idea. So here's exactly how the script is used. The two IP address is addresses in this situation, they each had one switch, one router. Every store had that. So that's what the IP addresses are. Input a CSV file. It's going to output your CFG files and output uh, changes to the host groups, and you can see at the end, community string, because it's SNMP v2. There's an actual example. Shows you the IP addresses, create, uses the script, creates stores, um, comes from a CSV, creates a, in this example, it creates a store CFG, so they can see each store in, uh, individually. There's a CSV file showing IP address, they did everything based on the name. The name was everything. Their name told you what this object should be able to do and what kind of service checks went to the object. There's an example of a, a template, a host template. They had lots of kiosks, host groups, simple stuff. Here is an exception. Here is a store service. It's using that template, but this is an exception. This is where they were checking their store Oracle disk, and they wanted to check it every 15 minutes. So local settings can be dropped in here because it's got those local settings empty by default. There's just some examples of the different kinds of hosts that they put in there. Um, just to show you that they had all kinds of different kinds of hosts. This, is a, each, this script will create one page for each switch and router for each store so that you can go to one location and understand what's happening with the bandwidth on all of your ports and all of that information that's related in one place. So that's Nagios Core. Nagios XI, we wrote a wizard. And this wizard is a modification of the bulk host modification wizard. So this wizard, the goal is what I call full deployment. In other words, I want to use as many host groups as I need because I don't want to mess with this host again. I want to do everything once. So it has address, host, host description, three host groups, host template, and parents. Don't forget to put in the parent setting. This will be a massive curse if you wait till last. You'll have to go to every one to make that change. So put in that host template. So I've got my OS metrics in one host group, and then I have two other host groups I can use depending on the kind of services that are on that host. 
So I'll choose a host. And here, instead of five fields, I have eight fields. Instead of five fields that are unique in the bulk host modification wizard, these do not have to be unique. I can use three different host groups. So all of my information, in this example, I am not cloning anything. I could clone if I wanted to, but I'm not cloning anything. I'm just using eight fields and then using my CSV information to bring in all of the information I want to implement. So a wizard is great in XI, but a Python script is going to be a whole lot more efficient. So what we did is we also wrote a Python script, exactly the same model. Everything's based on the five templates or the five objects. So you do have the three host groups. And this is much more efficient. Uh, it's pretty simple. You execute the command and point to the CSV file, and it's done. So this is how it works. You have your CSV file, and there is a import directory that Nagios XI has. So Nagios XI was designed so that you could push things into this directory from Puppet, for example. And so you can use this import directory. Now, one of the problems that you have to understand about the import directory is it's designed to bring new stuff in. It's not designed to make modifications. So in order to make this work, we pull the host groups file out of Nagios, bring it into the import directory, make modifications, and bring it back in. So that's one of the things you have to understand with this import directory. Execute the script, everything's in place. Here's the CSV file, IP address, host name, alias. Notice that the host groups that you use are within single quotes, so that the script understands this is what you need to do. Also, those host groups end with HG, so that the script understands that they are host groups. Here's a couple examples. Uh, implementing one host group, two host groups, two host groups in a parent setting, you have all those options. You don't have to do everything if you don't want to, but it does have all of those features if you did want to uh, implement those. Here's some examples of naming convention. You're also going to have to think about a naming convention so that you know what you, what, what's what, what makes sense. You don't have to do it this way, but you do want to think about your naming convention. Uh, there are services. There you can see example of Linux CPU, OS metrics, uh, MySQL metrics, whatever you want to do. Now, the other thing is, is you're probably going to want to use contact groups, so you can put users in and out of that contact group, so you just tie those contact groups to your service template and your host template. When you run the script, you're looking for two outputs. First, you're looking, it does the pre-flight check, and you want to know that there are no errors. Secondly, when it brings that information into the database, you also want to see a zero, which is going to tell you, hey, it came into the database, and it's all OK. So there's two things that you want to look at. You also want to look in the import directory. Does it still have stuff in there? That means you've got problems. It should remove everything out of the import directory. There's the actual location for download. If you want to download the scripts, they're there for you to do so. So any questions, raise your hand, and they'll come by with a microphone. Hi. I understood um, in your, the way you organize things, how you overrode the host behavior by defining uh, attributes in the host. Um, but I, I didn't quite understand how you overrode the service behavior for services that got inherited through the host groups. OK, so the services are exactly the same as the host. The service that you set up, say CPU, you select the, the, the actual service that you want to check, CPU, whatever. You select that. You tie it to a service template, and you put in a name. The rest is empty because all of the necessary check settings, notification settings, are coming from a service template. So the service template is managing all of your services. Does that make sense? So you would have a unique service template for 
each of your exceptions? Each group. Okay, so I have Apache group. So I have 100 Apache servers. So with that Apache host group, I'm going to tie that to a service template, which is going to manage all of the Apache service checks. So all I have to do is put uh, a host in the host group for Apache, and all of those checks are populated. It's not a service group, it's a service template. Now I understand, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it, it, the object inheritance takes a little bit of time to come up to speed on, but it really is valuable in terms of implementation and management down the road. And you can see, this is a basic structure. You can make this way more complex, but you can also shoot yourself in the foot. No questions? This big group? Mike, you're, you must be explaining fantastically. Nothing. All right. Nothing to do with what you've just talked about, but no one's going to ask another question. I just, I, I guess, you, you focus there on using WMI for checking. Is there a particular reason you use WMI rather than um, NS client checks or any others. I mean, there's so many, and, and you know, the fact I've never used WMI, but I see that you did a big stuff there. I'm just wondering why. So it's a, probably a religious war. Yeah, it's a good question because I got this project. They said our Windows administrators refused to put an agent on the Windows host. Okay, what options do I have? They have Windows 2012. I don't have the option of SNMP any longer. I have one option, and that is WMI. That's the reason we use WMI in that project. And so a lot of those decisions are based on what the company you're dealing with. This happens all the time with databases where the Oracle or SQL database guys always have big opinions about how you're going to touch their stuff. And so you just have to deal with that, and that's kind of what determines a lot of your options. Okay, I understand. And I love your, um, your little database there. I, I did the same, but in a spreadsheet. Um, you know, you have to have a service catalog, and you can show then your clients or whatever that, you know, these are the checks, and this is what, um, this is how long it's going to run for, and, and, you know, how often. So, yeah, same, same sort of thing. Um, is that database available as well, or you? The database, I, I'm wanting to um, open it up once I have a thousand checks. Because I want to be able to be meaningful. Um, I teach the Nagios uh, training classes. I do the Nagios training. So what I'm going to do is open it up to my Nagios students first and get their feedback and make adjustments. Because I want to get a lot of input before I get 5,000 checks in there and find out, oh, this is not what was useful for the other companies. So eventually, that's going to be available. Uh, if you send me an email and you say, hey, listen, I'd like to take a look at this uh, when you get that available, I'll put you on the list. Fantastic. Thanks for your work, Mike. That's great. Anybody else? Okay. Well, how about a nice round of applause for Mike Weber?